Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read some The 50th Law by 50 Cent Robert Greene. 50 Cent Robert Greene's main message is basically be fearless. That's the 50th Law. Be fearless. Don't allow fear to grab, uh, grab a hold of your life. A lot of times Tupac says uh, fear is stronger than love. Fear is stronger than love. And fear is a better controlling device than love. Machiavelli, check it out. He studied the laws of power and politics. Machiavelli. Fear and love, though. Love should conquer fear. Love should beat fear. So in order for love to win, you've got to be fearless. There is no choice. you got to be fearless. You have to be. Like I said, you ain't got a choice. Okay, so... Page 145. In the ring, our opponents can gouge us with their nails or butt us with their heads and then leave a bruise, but we don't denounce them for it or get upset with them or regard them from then on as violent types. We just keep an eye on them, not out of hatred or suspicion, just keeping a friendly distance. We need to do that in other areas. We need to excuse what our sparring partners do and just keep our distance without suspicion or hatred. Marcus Aurelius. Lead from the front. Authority. In any group, the person on top consciously or unconsciously sets the tone. If leaders are fearful, hesitant to take any risk, or are overly concerned for their ego and reputation, then this invariably filters its way through the entire group, and it makes effective action impossible. Complaining and uh, her heraging Harrowing, harrowing people to work harder has a counterproductive effect. You've got to adopt the opposite style. You've got to imbue your troops with the proper spirit through your actions and not words. They see you working harder than anyone, holding yourself to the highest standards, taking risk with confidence, and making the tough decisions. This inspires and binds the group together. In these democratic times, you must practice what you preach. The Hustler King. No man can properly command an army from the rear. He must be at the front, at the he very head of the army. He must be seen there, and the effect of his mind and personal energy must be felt by every officer and man present with it. General T. Sherman. So General William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, his famous for Sherman's march to the sea and during the Civil War. He's also responsible for coming up with total warfare. William uh, Tecumseh Sherman. He was marched to the sea. He was a Union general and just burned all the houses and engaged in terrorism, right? Attacking civilians uh, in order to demoralize the population and win the Civil War. By the spring of 1991, young Curtis Jackson had proved himself to be one of the savviest hustlers in the neighborhood. His pool of repeat customers had increased to a point where he had to hire his own crew to keep up with their demand. But as he knew, nothing good ever lasts too long in the hood. Just as Curtis was making plans to expand his business, an older hustler named Wayne began to make threatening gestures towards him. Wayne had recently returned to the streets from prison. He was determined to make as much money as fast as possible and then dominate the local drug trade. Curtis, it seemed, was his main rival. He tried to intimidate the younger hustler, warning him that he better curtail his operations or he'll pay a price. But Curtis had just ignored him. So then Wayne decided to up the ante. He sent out word on the street that he was going to have Curtis killed. Curtis had seen this happen before and he knew what would happen next. Wayne would never do the job himself. He could not risk a return to prison. Instead, he was banking on the fact that some young kid would hear of his desire to kill Curtis and then eager to gain some street credibility would take it upon himself to do the dirty work. Sure enough, a few days after hearing of Wayne's intentions, Curtis noticed a young kid named Nitty trailing him on the streets. He felt sure that Nitty was the one planning to do the hit and that it would happen soon. This was the depressing dynamic of hustling in the hood. The more success a hustler had, the more he attracted the wrong kind of attention. Unless he inspired some fear and terror, rivals would, be keep, would keep coming at him trying to make, take what he had and continually threatening his position on the streets. Once that started to happen, the once successful dealer would find himself drawn into a cycle of violence, reprisals and time in the pen. 
There were a few hustlers, however, who had somehow managed to rise above this dynamic. Um, in the hood, they were like kings. Just hearing their names or seeing them on the street would elicit a gut reaction, a mix of fright and admiration. What elevated them above others was a series of action they had taken in the past that demonstrated they were fearless and smart. Their maneuvers would be unpredictable and all the more terrifying for it. If people thought of challenging them, they would quickly remember what these types had done in other circumstances and they'd back off. All this would give them an aura of power and mystery. Instead of challengers on all sides, they would have disciples ready to follow them as far as they wanted. If Curtis saw himself as the kingly type, it was time now to show it to others as dramatically as possible. With death staring at him in the face, he worked to control his emotions and he thought long and hard about the dilemma that Wayne had posed. If he came after Wayne to kill him first, Wayne would be ready and would have the perfect excuse to kill Curtis in self-defense. If instead he went after Nitty and killed him, the police would catch Curtis and he would end up in prison for a long time. An equally fortunate result for Wayne. And if he did nothing, Nitty would finish him off. But Wayne's strategy had a fatal flaw. His fear of doing the job with his own hands. He was no king himself, but just another frightened hustler pretending to be tough. And Curtis would come under him from an unexpected angle and turn everything around. Without wasting any more time, he asked a member of his crew named Tony to accompany him that afternoon. Together, they surprised Nitty on the street, and while Tony held him, Curtis slashed the kid in the face with a razor blade. He did it just deep enough to send him screaming to the hospital and to leave a nice scar for a while. Then a few hours later, he and Tony found Wayne's empty car, and they shot it up. An ambiguous message that either... And it meant either they hoped he was inside or they were taunting him to come out and attack them in the open. The following day, the dominoes fell, just as Curtis thought they would. Nitty sought out Wayne, expecting that the two of them would then go together to exact revenge on Curtis. After all, Wayne had been attacked as well. Wayne, however, still insisted the kid to do it alone. Now Nitty could see through the game. He was just a patsy to do the dirty work, and Wayne was not as tough as he had made himself out to be. Nitty would have nothing more to do with Nitty or uh, Wayne, but he was also too afraid to take on Curtis himself. He decided that he could live with the scar. Wayne was now in a delicate position. If he asked someone else to do the job, it would start to look like what it was, a man too scared to do it himself. Better to let the whole thing just go away. In the days to come, the hood was abuzz with the story of what happened. Young Curtis had outmaneuvered and outsmarted the older rival. Unlike the latter, he was unafraid to do the violence himself. What he had done was bold and dramatic. It had come out of nowhere. Every time people could see Nitty on the streets with the long scar on his face, they were reminded of the incident. Rivals would now have to think twice before challenging his status. He showed he was tough and crafty. And those in his crew were duly impressed with his saying Freud and how he had turned the situation around. Now they saw him differently as somebody who could last in this jungle and was worth following. Curtis followed this up with other similar actions, and slowly he elevated himself above the other hustlers. Now there were younger ones who looked up to him and would soon form the core of a devoted band of disciples who would help him in his transition to music. So to remind you what happened, okay, so Curtis, uh, he got the member of his gang named Tony to accompany him that afternoon. Together they surprised Nitty on the street, and while Tony held him, Curtis slashed Nitty in the face with a razor blade. And he did it just deep enough to send him screaming to the hospital and leave a nice scar. A few hours later, Curtis, 50 Cent, and Tony found Wayne's empty car and they shot it up. So 50 Cent took a guy and he took a razor blade and cut his face with it and then went to Wayne's car, the guy who had ordered the hit out, and shot it up. So uh that was the message and this is street hustle you know this is street hustle this is uh this is how you win respect on the street and actually it's not that much different with the police officers if you get a kill a so-called good kill while you wearing a badge while you got a gun uh on the street if you get a kill that's you know seemingly justified then uh that that gives you some street cred that gives you cred in the police force you know so After the success of his first album in 2003, 
Curtis, now 50 Cent, began to re realize his dream of forging a business empire, but as this took shape in the months and years to follow, he began to feel that something was wrong. It would be natural to believe that with his current position and fame, those working for him would simply follow his lead and do what he wanted. But his whole life had been a lesson in the opposite. People continually take from you. They doubt your powers and they challenge you. In this environment, his executives and managers were not trying to take his money or his life. But rather he had the feeling that they were nibbling away at his power, trying to soften his image and make him go corporate and predictable. If he let this go on, he would lose the only quality that made him different. His propensity to take risk and to do the unexpected. He might become a safe investment, but he would no longer be a leader and a creative force. In this world, you cannot relax and rest on your name, your past achievements, your title. You've got the fight to impose your difference and compel people to follow your lead. All these thoughts became painfully clear to him in the summer of 2007. His third album, Curtis, was to be released in September of that year, and everyone seemed to be asleep. The record label Interscope was acting as if the album was going to sell itself. His management team had put together a marketing campaign that he felt was too tame, passive, and corporate. They were trying to control too much. Then August afternoon, an employee at G-Unit Records, 50's own label with Inter Interscope, told him that a video from the upcoming album somehow just got leaked onto the internet. If it spread, it would mess up the carefully orchestrated rollout of songs that had been planned for that month. 50 was the first to hear this, and after contemplating what to do next, he decided that it was finally time to shake up the dynamic and do the unpredictable and play the part of the Hustler King. He called into his office, his radio and internet team at G-Unit, instead of working to contain the viral spread of the video, the usual response to such a problem and what management would advocate, he ordered them to surreptitiously... <laughs> surreptitiously leak it to other sites and let it spread like wildfire. So Curtis, uh, 50 Cent Curtis, I don't know his last name, <laughs> Curtis something. So Curtis something, <laughs> sorry Curtis something. So Curtis something, he uh, released his music onto the internet, and he's letting it spread like wildfire. Even though it's free, he's not getting any money. He is getting free publicity. So he's, he's flipping the script on the old corporate models and how it is that you unravel your new movie, your new song, your new whatever out. So he's flipping the script. He's changing the game. The way he's changing the game, he's allowed his music to be listened by everybody. So on top of the move... Uh, they created the following story to tell journalists for public consumption. When 50 had heard of the leak, he flew into a wild rage, and he threw his, his phone at the window with such a force that he had cracked it. He tore the plasma TV off the wall, and he smashed it into pieces. He left the building in a fit, and the last thing they heard him yelling was that he was shutting it all down. He was going on vacation. That evening, on 50's orders, they had the maintenance man for the building take pictures of the damage, and it was all faked just for this propaganda, and it was leaked. The photos were leaked on the internet. They were to keep all this a secret. Not even management was to know that this drama was completely manufactured. In the days to come, 50 watched with satisfaction as this story spread everywhere. Interscope was awakened from its slumber. Management was sent, had sent the message that he was now in command. If he refused to do any more publicity, he had threatened their whole campaign was doomed. They had to follow his lead here and let him set the tone for the publicity, which meant something more aggressive and fluid. Among 50's executives and employees, word spread quickly of what had supposedly happened. His reputation for being unpredictable and violent brought to life. When they now saw him in the offices, they felt a twinge of fear. Better to pay attention to what he wanted than risk witnessing his anger. And for the public, this was just the kind of story they expected from the thug rapper. It compelled their attention. They could laugh at his out-of-control antics, not realizing that it was 50 who was directing the drama and who would have the last laugh. The Fearless Approach When I reached the top in business, I adjusted to my new position. I became bolder and crazier than before, and I listened even less to people who tried to slow me down. So, I'll read some more. More 50 Cent coming up. Yeah, democracy begins at home, motherfuckers. <laughs>